This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, thank you, Susan, for that uh, overly generous introduction. Some of that may even be true, I think. Um, <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be here and actually um, grateful for Ron Rice and Susanna Scott um, for tackling a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I've devoted much of my professional life, say in the past 15 years, um, to take a hard look at global sustainability. Specifically, how can the 7.2 billion of us live uh, sustainably on this planet, or more specifically, for how long? And I'm always thinking of different ways to try to get across um, uh, ideas and make them accessible to readers. And that's who I, I write for, sort of a general audience. Um, now, I wish um, we talked a little bit about, a question came up about humor, and I'd wish that we could use humor to get across these inconvenient truths. But there's a shocking lack of good jokes about degraded environment or you know, climate change out there. And comedians, when asked about this, uh, have tried to explain why. And they say it's simply too earnest, and it's too dull and boring, and too worthy of serious reflection to make it good material. And I think Bill Maher, let's see if this works, yes. I think Bill Maher has got it right. He says that the environment has a technical problem, that it doesn't have an obvious, easy, funny target. And climate change is particularly tricky because it's a slow-moving disaster. Now, I have found that there are some visual gags that work, you know, um, like this one that offers absolute proof that climate change is real, or, or the one that, says, uh, that shows my favorite forecast of all time. Looks like Friday is going to be rather warm. Um, Fortunately, there are lots of other ways for us to get across, uh, get our heads around these big, slow-moving ideas, um, like climate change and the loss of nature. And I'm just going to share one. Um, and I'd like to just uh, start by telling you a story. And it was one of those that I collected while traveling the world to see for myself if our growing numbers was a significant factor in global sustainability, and uh, if if it is, what could be done about it. And what I'm talking about is the dreaded P word, population. It's actually something more controversial than climate change. Um, and population growth specifically and all that it entails. And to start, I just want to take a quick spin around the globe and take you to um, Central Africa, Southwest Uganda, to the windy and penetrable National Park. And you can see the park boundaries here. Um, uh, it's where the rainforest gets hemmed in by, um, by all these subsistence farms. And this place is desperately poor. And um, people uh, are poaching wood and other things from the forest. Um, and what it, but what I found is when it comes to writing about Africans, particularly poor Africans, you know, how hard it is to get editors at newspapers or generally Americans in, in generally to pay attention. It just seems too distant and the troubles seem like too much. Fortunately for me, I was there to um, meet um, Gladys Kalima Zukusoka. And Gladys was a veterinarian who worked for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And she had found her uh, life's calling to help the last 880, or yes, 880 mountain gorillas from going extinct. And gorillas here were getting sick from diseases they were picking up from humans, mostly measles and scabies. And there was one incident that really mattered, uh, made a huge difference in her life, and that was that a baby gorilla had picked up such a severe ca case of scabies, it had lost most of that thick fur that they need to survive in these cool, misty mountains. And Gladys heard this baby, it was crying, and she said this is extremely unusual for, for baby gorillas, unlike humans, that they almost never make a sound, and if it is, it's a happy sound. And she, but this, this one was clearly in pain, and there was, 
and, and it was very frustrating for her. Um, she followed them around from this group of gorillas for days, but could never get in a position to tranquilize them all, to dart them all. And that's about the only way you can safely intervene, is, is to dart the whole group. Finally, this baby died, and the mother was carrying it around for days, sort of poking at it, just didn't understand what happened, that this baby had died of pneumonia. Um, and she finally abandoned it. Jeez. Oh, finally abandoned it. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Gladys was just torn up. She felt completely helpless. There was nothing she could do um, to make a difference. Um, and she felt like she, she, her job was, um, wasn't really being very effective. So she quit her job with the government and founded a nonprofit group to focus on what she sees as the biggest threat. And that's pressures from population growth around windy and penetrable uh, forest. And the local hospital when I was there had shelves just filled with antiretroviral drugs, thanks to our tax dollars to fight AIDS and HIV. But you couldn't find a condom. You couldn't find any other kind of contraception. So Gladys decided to start training women in the villages um, to turn their homes, like Monica's house here, into makeshift clinics to do some basic sort of curative care, but also do what turned out to be the most popular thing, and that was to provide shots of Depo-Provera. It's a hormone to women um, uh, who want to avoid being pregnant. And this became really popular. And when I was there, she, there was a clinic being held, and this woman showed up, and I said, well, why are you here? And she said, she said I have six children, and I'm really tired. And she said, I don't have the energy to dig a bigger garden um, and to feed any more children. And, and she said, she also said she didn't know about this medicine that um, could, uh, could uh, protect her from pregnancy until Monica showed up after this training with this, this magic vial. And since then, this woman has shown up every three months without fail to sort of take control of her future. And what dawned on me at this moment was that what was good for this woman and her family on a deeply personal level was also good for the forest and for the endangered mountain gorillas. And, and given that deforestation is a significant part of, of climate change, that it has in some incremental way a, a benefit to one of the most daunting global challenges of our time. And this was the big aha moment for me. You know, I started out my reporting to see, you know, was human population growth a factor in, in um, sustainability? Was, was it an environmental issue? And it is. But I also found out it was a human rights issue. And it's not about telling poor women in developing countries how many babies to have. You know, it's instead, it's empowering these women to make decisions for themselves, to be able to plan their lives, their futures, and their families. And I've seen this over and over again in my travels, that if women have access to modern contraception and can get freed from the pressures of society, and that's controlling religious and tribal leaders, husbands, and mostly importantly, mothers-in-law, believe it or not, that they act quickly act like women just here in this country and decide to have two children apiece on average. Now, did this story work? I would argue it did, but not for the reasons I just told you about my personal aha moment, but from what I just showed you. You know, it's got a couple things going for it. It's got charismatic megafauna, um, uh, and I exploit these charismatic creatures every chance I get. It's also got a compelling character, you know, a wildlife veterinarian who isn't afraid to reveal her passion. And Gladys, is, uh, her enthusiasm is completely contagious, and it just takes one person. In fact, storytelling is almost always better with just one. And so for those of you who are either scientists or hopefully we have some who are training to be scientists here, my advice always is to answer that reporter's phone call if it comes. You know, and don't hide in your lab. Um, scientists, too many scientists, have this mistaken notion that to reveal passion for your work is somehow unscientific. And in reality, I think if you want people to care about what you do, if you want to open their minds and their hearts, I think you have to be more forthcoming with your own. And people, I think, are generally, we brought this up earlier, are interested in scientists because their jobs are really unusual. I mean, a lot of people haven't met that many scientists. And very often, you're really at the cutting edge of knowledge. 
Now, you heard earlier that I worked at the LA Times for a long time, and I think I'm the only card-carrying member of the mainstream media on this panel. Um, and even that, my card is somewhat lapsed because I uh, took a buyout about a, a little more than a year ago from the Times. And I've since joined the ranks of freelance writers with Jennifer and others. Um, so why did I leave? That's a fair question. I'm going to show you why. Um, if I can get a, ra uh, a show of hands, how many of you get one of these things at home, delivered home? Can I see hands? All right, just look around. All right. How many of you get two of those? And let's see, two pairs of hands. Okay. How many of you were raised in a household where your parents had one of these? Okay. Now you can see why I'm not there. The LA Times, like almost all newspapers, um, is suffering from a stunning drop in circulation and advertising revenue, and it's painful to watch that the journalistic ambitions uh, have been shrinking along with the budgets. And it's just a new reality, the editors tell me, you know. Um, and general in interest publications, they want to be relevant, but they need to be popular. It's a desperate need. It matters to the bottom line. All those subscriptions, all those clicks on their website are directly related to the value of advertising dollars. And so editors push, um, that, that pushes editors rather to dish up material they think that readers want, you know, that, um, that will make them more popular. And I wish I could say otherwise, but the assumed prescription for success is often not a climate change story. And, you know, uh, or looking at, you know, drilling rigs like uh, here near Bakersfield, you know, or an environmental story, you know, uh, you know, like the clear cutting in British Columbia, you know, and, and taking a hard look at our, some of our actions as the earth groans along in the Anthropocene. Instead, the well-documented clicks, and these are really well measured, follow the more acute tragedies like a plane crash or yesterday's train crash. Um, you know, uh, or a hurricane, or all too often, and I find this quite a mystery to me, you know, you've got beauty, you know, and um, celebrity, instant celebrity, um, and uh, even better when a celebrity, uh, you know, gets into trouble. And so how do those of us who like to write about climate change and environment uh, do in the competition for space against, against these, uh, these kinds of stories? Not very well. In fact, this has been measured um, uh, by Media Matters. They, look, they looked at um, ocean acidification versus the Kardashian sisters. Uh, I have written a lot about ocean acidification, you know, and that's those small bars off the left, and you can see how well the Kardashian sisters do. Now, I would be the first to admit that environmental stories are difficult to communicate uh, to general audiences. They're off, all too often, they're depressing. They can make uh, uh, readers feel overwhelmed by the scope of the problems. They can be dull, you know, given their slow incremental um, pace of change. And it's the same problem that doesn't make them good fodder for jokes. Um, you know, all this makes it just very easy for readers to want to turn the page, click to a different station, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, just uh, click to a different website. Yet I have found there's a few tricks. Um, I think it's always important to show these stories, uh, not to tell them, and to single out a key character, if you can, to give audiences a way into the sort of the larger, more complex topic. And of course, there's the charismatic critters, you know, um, to, to use any time we get a chance. So how do we compete with, say, Lindsay Lohan, which the LA Times is always fascinated by, um, you know, try to give them this. Um, you know, how do we compete with a Nick on a bender? You know, we try to give them this. Um, uh, <laughs> Now, I like to joke about exploiting these critters, right? Especially ones with big eyes. But these charismatic uh, creatures are actually ambassadors to the natural world. And I think many of us, um, uh, we seek a uh, connection with nature. And I feel like my job is to help make that connection. So I'm going to wrap up with one final example. I was asked to do a story looking at secondary effects of lead poisoning. And some of you may have heard about this fight over lead bullets, um, perhaps because so many California condors um, have, been, uh, have been dying uh, after wolfing down lead-laced uh, lead uh, carrion uh, filled with bullet fragments. Uh, 
some of the hunters, uh, some hunters say that this is part of the conspiracy to take away their firearms, and others say no, it's just just a way to switch to, um, you know, please switch to non-lead bullets that don't fragment, um, uh, even though they cost twice as much, they don't fragment the way lead bullets do. And it's fascinating to look at this when you see the lead bullet, when it hits, uh, say, a deer, for example, it can spray something like 18 inches from the entry wound. And then when hunters field dress their deer as they, so they don't have to pack the whole animal out and leave these gut piles behind, all sorts of other critters you know, wolf down the entrails and then can end up with um, a toxic dose of lead, you know, including our nation's bird. And lead can turn these, this strutting, scrappy, bald eagle into this pathetic, drooped wing uh, uh, warrior. Um, there have been studies that have been looking at this, you know, as this become an emerging issue in the nation's heartland. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of data and statistics, you know, but, you know, is this the best way to tell that story? I think there's a woman named Brene Brown at the University of Houston. I think she's got it right, that stories are just data with a soul. We remember them longer, and we hold them closer. And my editor and I decided that the best way was to follow the case of just one eagle. And so to do this story, I set off for Wilson, Wyoming, which is next to Jackson and the Jackson Hole, to the Teton Raptor Center. And this is a place where they work very hard to try to rehab birds of prey that come to them. And I picked up the trail of one eagle that was found by a rancher sitting in the snow. Um, and he was uh, in this lead-induced stupor, and he was simply too sick to fly. And he was transported by a pair of game wardens um, up and over the Continental Divide, more than 100 miles to the Raptor Center. And usually the wardens, they, you know, as this one told me, and they simply dispatch them with the revolvers because they know that very few are going to make it. Um, when this eagle was brought into the Raptor Center, it, um, the, the, the staff there had just lost two um, bald eagles in a row to lead poisoning in quick succession. And so in consulting with a local veterinarian, Dan Foreman, who volunteers his time, they decided to do more than just the usual, just the force feeding of fluids, you know, which they do three times a day, and sticking the bird in an oxygen chamber because the lead can sort of reduce so much of the muscle function that it makes it very hard for these animals to, to, to get enough air to, and, and live. This time they decided to go much more aggressive, and they took this three and a half inch spinal needle and they shoved it into the eagle's longest bone and created this catheter that um, with, was then infusing the eagle with this concoction of antibiotics, fluids, and also a chelating agent that would bond with the lead in the, um, in the bloodstream and help flush it from the system. Um, and after a while, it was interesting, this, this eagle, unlike those before it, um, that had died before it, suddenly snapped out of its lethargy. And it was, happened, to ha happened to happen just when one of the workers was lifting the eagle out of this oxygen chamber. Um, and using that sharp beak you can see that is built by evolution for ripping flesh, um, uh, clamped down on Megan's cheek, uh, she was one of the workers there, and punched a hole on it. You know, and she finally wrestled this eagle back into position and had a hold of his head. And she's looking, you know, she's looking at her cheek and the blood is running down her face. And she, and her reaction is, oh good, maybe this one will make it. <laughs> so this story was about, was about an eagle, but it was also about these care workers who just work you know, three times a day, they're feeding, seven days a week, anything it takes to try to save these birds. And she, um, and Megan knew the odds weren't very good. I mean, three out of four of these lead, uh, lead poison birds don't make it. And it was touch and go for this eagle as well. Um, and so I think work, doing the story on lead poison worked better just focusing on one. And I'm going to close with a, with a very short video that captured, uh, captured a rare moment in this line of rehab work. All right, so we're going to count to three. I'll pull the hood off, and Dr. Foreman's going to send it off to the east. Here we go. Oh. Everybody count. One, One two, two, three. three. <laughs> It 
never hurts to infuse just a little bit of hope in an environmental story. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as uh, Jennifer uh, said earlier today, I, I truly believe, uh, having studied science communication since uh, 1999 when I started graduate school, we are living in a, a golden age for science communication. There's more opportunities for scientists to engage the public and reach the public than any time in history. Uh, and I was saying to, to Ron this morning, uh, there truly is an explosion of science communication research, particularly in the area of, well, across different topics and different issues, but particularly in the area of sustainability and climate change. I was mentioning it's, very, it's difficult now for me even to keep up with uh, uh, the, so the vast amount of research is appearing across different journals at the interdisciplinary level and the disciplinary level. Um, so uh, as a researcher, I've, I've done a number of studies and I focus primarily on how the general public comes to understand uh, complex scientific and environmental related issues, looking in particular at the role of the media, particularly um, the role of the media in selectively framing issues in specific ways and how these selective frames interact with the social background, the ideology, and the political background uh, of the public, much like we saw in the movie last night, Merchants of Doubt, uh, the selective framing of those who deny climate change and how it interacts with ideology, particularly conservative ideology, and how these arguments are then carried through uh, different channels of the media, outlets such as Fox News, but also the mainstream press. Uh, in 2006, I, I moved from the faculty at Ohio State to American University in Washington, D.C. One of the reasons I wanted to move to Washington, D.C. is I wanted to be able to take my research and directly interact with uh, science organizations, federal agencies, and environmental groups who are trying to reach the public and trying to engage the public, and also policymakers themselves uh, and journalists. Um, and I spent a lot of time uh, sitting in closed door meetings and going to public meetings like this. Um, and through that experience, I started to think that there's another public that matters here in our uh, in debates over climate change and other science issues. And that's influentials, people like yourselves, people who are academics, people who are deeply committed to action, people who might be advocates, but also includes people like journalists and funders and philanthropists uh, and others who um, we often don't study, we often don't problematize the way we do uh, uh, the general public. Um, and I started to think, so when I went to these meetings and I would and I look at people's sort of judgments and decisions and the frames of reference they would use in talking about complex problems like climate change, I observed certain things, uh, also watching documentary films as well. So for example, uh, one of the clips this morning, uh, looking at the scientists working uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, his description of nature was a very particular framing of nature, that nature is uh, uh, possibly only of value if it's pristine, if it's untouched by man. Uh, there was a comment there about how uh, being out in uh, the jungle, this pristine place, he was able to observe uh, evolutionary processes in their true form. The implication is that uh, evolution in nature comes in, only comes in its true form in the absence of humans, right? That's one particular way of thinking about nature and evolution, but it's not the only way. It's not the, uh, and, and that's a contested interpretation of nature. But that, that model, that mental model, has direct implications for how we think about conservation policy uh, and how we debate and discuss the issue uh, among influentials, including academics and experts. Um, in, the, in the documentary last night, at the end of the documentary, my colleague Saul Hart, who you'll hear from uh, later today, sort of the moral lesson of the film um, and, and the focus on solutions at the end, the sort of takeaway is a dominant narrative, as we'll talk about, that's uh, been sort of dominant since at least in Communion Truth, is that climate change is solved by pricing, uh, pricing carbon, so passing a carbon tax, uh, and then we have the technologies we need to tackle the problem. We're just missing political will, right? And those technologies, as you saw at the end, were solar and wind. And if we could only overcome denial or gain, speak up, as the film tells us at the end, then we'd be able to solve uh, climate change. So I decided when I was on sabbatical in 2012 um, that I started to need to say, well, where are these stories come from that influence influentials and decision makers, right? How we talk about these issues. And I started to need to start looking at uh, a switch lens from the audience being the general public to being people like ourselves. And I decided I needed to look at sort of the super achieving storytellers, right, that we often read, that we might become interested in an issue by reading these uh, popular authors, people like Bill McKibben, people like uh, Tom Friedman, uh, people like Andrew Revkin, who I knew, I know spoke here at UC Santa Barbara 
uh, in the fall. And I decided to need to look and go back and look at the literature on the role that public intellectuals play uh, in how we think and decide complex issues and how they shape debate. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today, some of that research that I've begun to publish on and, and I continue to take a look at. So uh, in, in 2010, I started working on a project where I was looking at, in part, how the major foundations who have funded action on climate and energy, these are nine major foundations, some of the wealthiest foundations uh, in the world, um, how they define climate change as a social problem, what the solutions might be. Um, and their planning doc document, their master planning document, was a 50-page document called the Design to Win document. They spent, they hired a consulting firm to interview economists and scientists. Um, and the, the planning document was released uh, a few months, about six months after Inconvenient Truth came out. Um, and the framing in that document, what kind of problem is climate change and what might be the solutions, directly reflect the narrative that Al Gore uh, talked about uh, in that film. Uh, and that was that, as, uh, as, as many people, uh, uh, economists like uh, Nicholas Stern talk about, that climate change is fundamentally a market failure. And it's correctable by putting a price on carbon. If we only price carbon, then the market itself will drive social change. So the, the report talks about a cap on a carbon output and an accompanying market for emissions permits will prompt a sea change that washes over the entire global economy. Uh, and like the last night's film ended on, and Inconvenient Truth ended on, the good news is that we already have the technology know how to achieve these carbon reductions off at a cost savings. So that solar, wind, uh, and efficiency were the technologies that were talked about in the report. The report is noticeable that it's a 50-page document, only has a couple, uh, a couple paragraphs about communication and communication challenges, even though they were planning to fund different types of communication strategies uh, and campaigns. Uh, and this is Hal Harvey, who uh, was the program officer at the Hewlett Foundation, who commissioned the report, went on to head up the Climate Works, being interviewed by Tom Friedman. I think this was in 2000 and, uh, 2009. Uh, as Hal, Hal Harvey defined or framed the challenge is that climate change, it, like a, uh, unlike a lot of large-scale problems, uh, is actually one that is solvable, right? We can end, we can solve climate change. It is also one where we know what we need to do. We have the best data in the world on how to prevent climate change. Everything was ranked by magnitude, location, and sector. It's a systematic approach to problem solving. So in this statement, it's a, it's a frame of reference that climate change is a technocratic problem, right? If we can just mobilize the power of science economics, we can solve it. Um, and this is, this, is the, um, this is the funding strategy. This is how the foundations then decided, based on this framing of the issue, what kind of programs and activities to fund. So what I did is I put together a database of uh, about 1,247 grants. Each grant had a description of the policy or technology or the action that it was funding. And then I just um, then uh, coded each grant by that focus, and then I tallied up the results. And so you can see the differential emphasis in investments. There was a heavy investment uh, overall, the foundations, I had a record of about $360 million in grants. There's some missing data. So it was about $550 million uh, that I estimated that they invested in climate and energy across these years. Um, and so there's a heavy, heavy focus on what's called the soft energy path, right? Uh, an investment in renewables, solar, wind, um, different carbon pricing strategies, cap and trade and international agreement, and then things like fuel economy standards and public transportation. What was missing from their investment was uh, an alternative set of technologies that a lot of experts argue that we need to solve climate change or to meaningfully reduce emissions. And that is things focusing on uh, the development or the evaluation of carbon capture and storage. There was not a single grant focused on nuclear energy, as an example. Or importantly, the role of government through research and development, planning and spending, and catalyzing the innovation, not, not the market, but government in driving the innovation that we need. Um, and then finally, there was uh, a, a very limited focus on, on resilience strategy or public health or the human dimensions of the issue. So very little funding on adaptation and resilience, which seems odd today because there was so much focus on resilience now, protecting public health, or, or importantly on justice and equity. So this was the dominant paradigm. This was the, the, the dominant framing that drove a lot of strategy, a lot of investment, as you see, going up through 2011 and the defeat of cap and trade. And in, the, and in the wake of the defeat of cap and trade and the perceived failure of Copenhagen, there was now a paradigmatic vacuum, right? There was room for alternative frames, alternative stories to emerge uh, that offered up a different rendering of the problem and, and what needed to be done. And this is what we see over the last couple of years in the growth of the climate justice movement, uh, captured most recently by the international bestseller by Naomi Klein, 
uh, called This Changes Everything, Ca uh, Capitalism versus the Climate, and also as sort of the, uh, the animating narrative that, that inspired many people uh, in direct action across communities across the country, but also, for example, in the climate march in New York City last year that turned out 350,000 people. So for Nami Klein, climate change is not correctable by the market. In fact, actually, it's a problem driven by capitalism. And if we're going to solve climate change, we actually have to un upend the status quo, right? We actually have to challenge our accepted norms of, of capitalism. We need to degrow our economies. We need to retreat from globalization. Um, and we need to, as Bill McKibben, who is also sort of our intellectual confederate, says, we need to give up our too muchness, right? We need to, to turn away from consumption and materialism. And there's a very strong technology narrative as well. They share an interpretation with sort of mainstream environmentalism that we, that we, we need to switch from fossil fuels to renewables, right? And there's, a, and there's along with the movement, uh, animating the movement is also a strong opposition and resistance to natural gas fracking and also uh, nuclear energy. But there's a third rendering. There's a sort of a minority perspective, right? That's beginning to emerge. You might have heard, some of you might have heard about this. It's called, uh, they call themselves the eco-modernists. They recently re released the eco-modernist manifesto. I have a commentary in the Chronicle of Higher Education this week about the eco-modernist manifesto, comparing it to these other discourses and narratives. And around the time that the climate march was happening, the hashtag on Twitter uh, for the climate march was people's climate. And Andrew Revkin, who spoke here in the fall, uh, who uh, maybe doesn't self-describe as an eco-modernist, but I put him in that category. He started, uh, he started tweeting under the hashtag people's energy. Um, and this argument, uh, as, as uh, Ken showed us earlier, when th we, we, the argument of eco-modernists is that when, we, when we're tackling climate change, we can't forget about the energy access problem. In fact, we have a moral duty to think about people living in, in places like Africa and these deeply underdeveloped countries, right? And what they argue is that these countries are going to meet their human development goals. As you can see, this is a, a figure from uh, the Clean Air Task Force, a group in Boston uh, that I've worked with. When we look at the relationship between energy access, energy consumption, and human development, the countries that have the greatest amount of consumption and access to energy score the highest on, on the human development index. Right? And each one of these countries are trying to climb that index. Right? Their national, their political leaders and their publics are demanding an increase in their economic growth, not just their economic growth, but their human security. Right? And unless we can provide them access to energy, right, we're not going to enable, to enable their demand. Um, and so we need to think about policies and technologies that meet this energy demand problem. And, it, and, and renewables are probably not going to meet that challenge, or at least the renewables we have today. Okay, so here's, here's what's interesting, is that on the center left and on the left, among uh, intellectuals and advocates arguing for action on climate change, there are important and clear distinctions in how they frame the issue, the problem, and what they see as solutions. Why is this the case? And, and as I started working on this during my sabbatical, I read a book that's been very influential uh, to me uh, by a, a scientist in the UK who used to head up the Tyndall Center on Climate Research, Mike Hume. This book is called uh, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. And he kind of helped popularize this idea from the policy sciences about this idea of climate change being a super wicked problem. Unlike the foundations as they defined it, climate change is not conventionally solvable. We're going to do better or worse at managing it. Right? Hopefully, we'll do better. Um, but because of its complexity, its uncertainty, oftentimes in climate change, we think we have a solution, but that actually shows us more dimensions of the problem. So corn-based ethanol and biofuels would be an example where we thought that was or proposed or framed as a solution. It actually ends up using more land and, and emitting more emissions. Right? So it generates more of the problem. And out of this complexity and uncertainty, people on the center left and on the left, but people on the right as well, they read into climate change their hope for future, what they believe to be the good society. Um, and it becomes an opportunity for, as we see um, with the climate justice movement, and Naomi Klein argues, for example, that climate change is an opportunity for people on the left to finally fulfill their social justice goals. In fact, to correct the wrongs of slavery and colonialism. People on the left who have, who, who have worried about economic justice and globalization have not worked, uh, who, and have not worked on climate change in the past. You've been overlooking your best opportunity to achieve your goals. Right? For the Design to Win report, climate change was an opportunity to sort of reinvent sort of this technocratic society where we have market-based action around renewables, which they've long argued for as an alternative uh, to fossil fuels. 
And so as Mike Hugh writes in uh, a recent collection of essays, climate change is a synecdote, a figurative turn of phrase in which something stands in for something else, for something more important than simply the way humans are changing the weather. Okay, so if that's, if that's the nature of climate change as a social problem, what role do public intellectuals play? These super achieving storytellers, right? Who is a public intellectual? And I had to look at this, this literature across different fields to figure this out. Um, and one of the key de defining characteristics of a public intellectual is that they write for a broader audience, right? But they're more than just popularizers. They're more than just a scientist writing about their technical field for a broader audience. They go beyond their technical field and they engage in deep synth synthesis and integration. They give us a bigger, uh, a bigger understanding of the problem. But they do something else as well. And, and, and so Elizabeth Colbert, for example, who just won the Pulitzer Prize, she does both of these things in her writing and her books. But she stops short of something that I would say is a key characteristic of public intellectual others have argued. That's that they're social critics. They're advocating for change. They're advocating for particular causes uh, or, pol or particular policy direction. Sometimes themselves, like Bill McKibben or Naomi Klein, they become movement leaders. They become activists themselves. And then how do they influence us? Well, one of the things that I talk about uh, in this paper that I just published, in, in part, they become personalities and celebrities. And, and as Jennifer talked about uh, in uh, her, her uh, talk this morning, they take advantage of this online media ecosystem where their influence transcends beyond their books or a printed article where people across the globe now can grow up as students or as advocates reading their work. So Bill McKibben's uh, piece on divestment at Rolling Stone magazine, it helped launch this movement. It, was, it went instantly viral. It was the most read uh, article in the history of Rolling Stone magazine online. Right? But importantly, when they reach people, what they do is they set a particular frame of reference. They create storylines and narratives about what kind of problem climate change is. And these discourses and narratives, without direct overt coordination among advocacy groups, among advocates, among students, among journalists, right, they help, they help set the conditions through which think people talk and think about these problems. Right? So they have sort of an indirect, sort of an informal coordinating function. Right? People uh, study, work, and advocate within one discourse over another. Uh, so what I, what I started doing is I started looking at who are these public intellectuals across these discourses, and I spent better part of a year reading all of their books. And in a recent article, and I'm working on some other papers and eventually a book on this topic, I then try to condense down these different discourses into a single table that I then elaborate on uh, in the paper. And this is how I break them out. I talk about the ecological activists, who are people like Nami Klein, Bill McKibben, uh, people like David Suzuki, Clive Hamilton, a philosopher uh, in Australia. Their problem framing is fundamentally climate change is a function of our too muchness, of capitalism. And the only way that we correct or we, we solve climate change or try to limit climate change is by upending the, the, our capitalist system. Um, their outlook on nature is reflective of the outlook that the scientists this morning offered, that, so, that nature is this sacred, pristine, fragile place. In fact, there's a religious quality to nature. It's a place that we go to lose ourselves, right? And it should be, it should be walled off. It should be uncontaminated by the presence of humans. Um, there, um, <clears throat> and the, the, the other, uh, and I'll wrap up in, in just one minute, right? So, the other major discourse are the smart growth reformers. This still remains the dominant paradigm. It's reflected in the foundation strategy that I showed you. People like Tom Friedman, uh, people like uh, Nicholas Stern, people like Jeffrey Sachs, right? That climate change is correctable by pu putting a price on carbon. Um, and then the final, the final discourse, uh, and I need to wrap up here, but the final discourse are, are the eco-modernists. The key distinction of the eco-modernists are two things. One is they say, yeah, price on carbon is important, but we can't overlook the central f uh, role of the state. We need state planning and state spending that drives the innovation we need, right? And also, we don't have the arsenal of technologies we need to deal with the problem. We need to consider things like nuclear energy, carbon capture, things like genetically modified food and agriculture and other things. Their, their model of politics is also different. They say that political change happens uh, primarily through self-reflection, right, and engaging in ideas and, and, and discussion and dialogue with others. And once innovation happens and technology is available that lowers the cost of action, that's when political leaders and the public will finally agree across the ideological spectrum to act, be, act, be, uh, act on behalf of the same goal. Okay, so I'm out of time. There's a lot there. But if you want to read these papers, you can go to my website, climateshipproject.org uh, studies, and you can find all those papers freely available online. Thanks.
Okay, um, by the way, English major, UCSB. <laughs> Yay! Um, okay, so you're a researcher on this campus, you're an engineer, you're a scientist, and you've discovered this cool new thing. You've made some innovation, you have some insight that you want to talk to people about. The thing is, the language of your discovery, usually featured in some high profile academic journal, is not as accessible to the public as you would like it to be. It sounds great for explaining to other scientists and engineers, but if you're trying to reach out to the general public, most of this will fly over their heads. This is where I and my colleagues come in. As writers for the Office of Public Affairs and Communications on this campus, our jobs are to make research written in this exacting and very technical language more digestible to our audience, the general public. We can do this for virtually every discipline on campus, um, including the humanities, social sciences, and arts education. But science and engineering, I have to say, are special creatures. Because of the level of technicality, high-level research like the kind that happens here deals with things that most people don't normally think about or encounter in the course of everyday life. And yet these scientific developments are the kinds of things that have the potential to influence policy decisions, business practices, or even the way society functions or chooses to function. And so these people, this general public, who vote, who invest money, participate in economies, raise future generations, use natural resources, run for office, these people need to access science in a way that's understandable and also meaningful, and ideally make evidence-based decisions that could benefit humanity in general, or at least do no harm. So I'm really glad to see the way humanities and sciences are coming together to suss out the issue of how to communicate about science. I think there's generally a recognition of the importance of knowing science and a desire to be able to access it without the intimidation of having to spend too much time getting technical or the presumption that it's just too difficult to understand and so therefore not worth the effort. This particular moment is also significant because we as a modern society have become more aware of the impacts our actions have on other people in other places and vice versa. And the problems we face now are large scale and global and would take everyone's effort, understanding, critical thinking and participation to solve. So the beauty of writing for the general audience is the reach. We try to talk to everyone. We have the internet, we have social media in addition to traditional source, sources of news and information. Never has it been so easy to reach people next door or the other side of the earth. The challenge of writing for the general audience is also the reach. We are trying to talk to everyone. So how does one convey the information to people who may not have the interest or the background to process it? When you write about topics that are new, new discoveries, innovations, emerging technology, how much can you assume people know? There's really no one slam dunk answer for these questions, especially for those of us who write for the general public. They're just challenges that we face constantly. And um, actually, personally, it's part of the beauty of science writing is because it allows you to get creative with how you express your ideas. The good thing is we have a lot of tools at our disposal. We've heard a lot about them today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go um, and get really specific to what we do at the Office of Public Affairs and Communications. Um, can we get the present? Oh wait, actually, let's not yet. Let's just go back to the other one, yeah. All right, so I forgot about this. <laughs> um, allow me to introduce you to the UCSB Current, which is our main platform for communication. And you can check it out, there's the link up there. And this is actually uh, the, a hybrid. Uh, we talked about this ecosystem of communications earlier. And it's, uh, it's a hybrid of all our news releases and our stories online. And it's also a news source. So people can actually, journalists can actually use this, this material and use it as source material or as part of their stories. And, but people also come to this site itself just for the news and research information. It's about a year and a half old and we are constantly making improvements. So there's a lot, we've, we've talked about things like storytelling and narrative and um, if you actually read some of our stories, a lot of them, I refer to them as stories also, not just press releases, uh, a lot of them gen generally offer more than just the facts. When I first started working for public affairs, one of the first things my news director told me was that we are storytellers. We're not just pumping out press releases. So, and since the majority of us in the office are actually former journalists, 
we're really okay with that. This is what we like to do. And we've already talked about how stories are often the best way to convey com complex science because context is everything. When you're writing for an audience with different levels of awareness and knowledge about new and technical things, context is, when it, is what's going to help level the field for everyone. Finding a human-sized element for people to identify with is what's going to sustain their interests and keep them coming back. And this has been mentioned a little bit earlier. Another reason context and stories are so important to us that in journalism is that journalism has been and is changing, at least in the print newspaper sense, which is where I come from. Newspapers can't really afford to pay someone to focus on the science alone, let alone with the diligence and the responsibility and the, just the research required to turn out a good story. So in a way, when we write some of our stories here, we try to meet them halfway. We try to provide that context or that way of entering into the subject. Uh, also, you've probably noticed how easy it is in this day of digital media and social media to chop things up and extract only bits of information. Sometimes it's just a meme. Sometimes it can be pretty dangerous, like when a politician of one persuasion or another uses some scientific bullet point sans context to influence legislation. Now, we can't police that from where we are, but we can at least try to make sure that there is something out there that has the correct information and the appropriate context. So here's the process. And which is the, there's like three things here. Which one do I use? <laughs> Um, the Prezi. Okay, and how do you move forward? Okay. All right, so let's see if this works. Yeah, you're going to have to do it for me. It's really quick. Can you just move ahead? Am I? Oh, yeah, there you go. I don't know how it got all the way over there. All right, yay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so here is how we tell our story. So we get the tip. A lot of times we get the Eureka Alert notice. Does everybody know what Eureka Alert or has any familiarity with what Eureka Alert is? Okay, it coordinates uh, the publication of studies with journalists who write about those studies. And uh, it, it's actually really interesting. Um, so we get these notifications via Eureka Alert of soon to be published papers involving UCSB researchers. And we also find, find out through word of mouth. We get told that something's gonna happen, something's coming out. So we, we're on the alert for that. Um, secondly, we contact our scientist. Uh, does the researcher want a story written about his or her paper? If no, then game over, we're done. Um, if yes, then we set up interviews, and a lot of times we actually do get yes. And sometimes the research doesn't warrant a story, or there's not enough time, or it's just inconvenient, or people are out of town. So there's a lot of reasons why stories don't happen, but most of the time we get yes, and because of the kind of technology we have, we can actually communicate you know, everywhere, so that's great. Uh, the next thing is the interview and writing of the story. The, the interview can be, we use pretty much any media we can to get in touch with our scientists. Um, I prefer face-to-face -face interactions the most. I think I get the most information out of all of them, especially since I am not a scientist and I need all sorts of ways of understanding things. After that, we send the story out to the researcher or the group, and I, this is fact-checking, basically. This is getting the science right. Um, they make any comments, they make suggestions, and there's this whole, I mean, this can happen once and we can move on to the next step, or we can do it over and over again until every, everybody's happy, basically. And it depends. If there are lots of researchers, it might take a while. If not, you know, everybody has their kind of mood about this. Some, some people decide they just want to, they're okay with it and we're ready to go. Other people are very picky about things. So that's the kind of thing that we have to negotiate, you know, because we really want our scientists to be satisfied with what's going out because it has to be defensible. It represents the university. It represents them. And we, it's when something wrong goes out, if, as we've noticed earlier with the uh, God particle situation, it can be very wrong. So nothing is sent to the media until everyone is satisfied. And that kind of can be tricky, especially when you're you know, reiterating the same review and rewrite over and over again. But if I'm lucky enough to get my draft back and everybody's happy, I wind up 
sending it through my office for just style edits and grammar because we are former journalists and we like to conform to Associated Press. <laughs> and um, so we make sure that everything sounds good, sounds smooth, works well. The next thing we do is we prepare for publication. We have the back end of the UCSB current and we work with the content management system. We load everything in there. Simultaneously, we've been getting photos or video if there's time and, and desire and effort and there's good material. And uh, we put everything into the current and we add our tags and meta information so that it's for search purposes as well. And then we head it out to publishing. So the story goes live, and it's scheduled to coincide with the lifting of the embargo by the journal. The release is sent to Eureka Alert again, and they disseminate, disseminate the uh, information to their own list, and we have our own extensive list, including specialized media. And then internally, we will send a PDF version of the release and a link to the online story to the researcher, the group, the department chair and the dean of the appropriate college. So we email ourselves everything as well. And that's pretty much it as far as what we do in the office. It's kind of a simplistic way, but um, this is what we do. So let me see where am I? How do we know if the story got any attention? That's actually kind of difficult. We don't know, we can't say exactly how much attention a story can get. We say maybe social, we can tell maybe through social media if people respond or forward things, we can follow the story around that way. Uh, we can tell if other publications have picked it up, so that's also useful, but we can't really tell how many eyeballs have been on the story. That's kind of really difficult to assess. Um, generally speaking, we can estimate that some stories will be more popular than others. Uh, usually stories with a more human, relatable component will be picked up, such as things like psychology, neurobiology, bioengineering tends to be pretty popular. And so we can estimate that it will have some wide distribution then. Environmental stories obviously are also a big deal, especially the large scale, the ones that have to do with large scale events like the ocean plastic pollution stories and oil spills and obviously climate change. So um, can we go back to the other one? And you, okay. So this is the most recent story I wrote on artificial intelligence, and I was really excited to write it because I hadn't written about artificial intelligence before. And Dmitry Strukov, you'll see him come out. This, he's in the photo. He's in the bottom bottom right. He was really great interview. He was excellent at breaking things down. The story almost just wrote itself. And um, I heard it got some good pickup and I saw and it was it's actually even as of an hour ago I was checking Google. Um, it's still getting more play. So that's very positive actually. So, um, and actually I also got emails from other people, uh, from people across the world asking if they could reprint, translate, and you know, it was actually more than I expected it to be for an artificial intelligence story. But, um, so what made it a worthwhile story? I think one of the reasons was that AI is actually just a very fascinating subject. It's an engineering discipline, but it studies how human cognition works. So there's that relatable factor to it. Also, artificial intelligence carries with it that kind of science fiction Hollywood appeal. It's really part of our culture. We have stories by Philip K. Dick. We have the um, Terminator movies. We have robots in every story that we, we tell ourselves. So, the tech, it, so it actually kind of allows people to access it that way too. There is that component. And then the tech itself in the real world has the potential to solve problems, real problems. So I think in that particular case, this particular research, there's a little bit of something for everyone. And this group, particularly this group, was actually great. They were very responsive, very excited. They really wanted, you know, they were eager to talk and, and get their news out. And, and so everything just got made really easy for me. Brian, up on the upper, upper right hand corner, he was actually, uh, he actually approached me and he said, may I have the end quote? He wanted the sort of, yeah, he was like, I want the witty end quote, the uh, sort of uh, kind of the insightful thing that people say at the end of stories. You know, there's always that person at the end of a story that summarizes the story. He wanted that. Basically, he had this punchline that he needed to set up. And so I was like, yeah, okay, let's do it. You know, because I like that kind of collaboration. It shows they're excited and they're willing to engage. And so there is a Easter egg joke at the end of the story if you check it out. 
Okay, so finally, here's a short list of three things that I have found work when I'm communicating about science. Coming from a humanities background, talking to someone who's you know, very knowledgeable about their own science, I often try to get as much information as possible. So the first thing I try to do is face-to-face -face communication. The face-to-face -face interview for me is one of the best tools for interviewing, and it also works the other way. If you are a scientist and you're worried about getting your message across to someone, it's easier to do so if you're doing it with a person as opposed to emails. I think it's a little bit more comforting um, also because Essentially, at least in my position, I'm on the same team as the scientists, so it, I don't want to have that. There's that trust factor, basically, that you want to establish with them, that you, know, you are understanding what they are saying. And the communication itself works really well, too. Uh, we, have, we pick up little nonverbal cues about each other. If they notice that I'm not understanding them, which is quite often, they'll be like, well, you know, modify my strategy to get you to understand what I'm talking about, and it happens quickly. So it's really great for that purpose. And also, I tend to pick up things about the researcher themselves as a person uh, that, is, that make it into the story sometimes, like the jokes, like how they feel about their science like their perspective, because they're scientists, and that's not something I would think about. And that, you know, it'll make it into the jokes. If they have a favorite phrase that they use, then that works too, because they probably thought it was good. Uh, secondly, the next strategy I have is to think visually. We have a lot of, we're internet-based now, we're digital media, we're social media, and before, it was mostly text, so we didn't, as writers, we didn't really worry too much about the images, but now everything screams for it. You have to have it, and it creates more impact, and it is also more memorable, and it, ex it takes a lot of the burden of explanation away from the story as well, because then you don't spend that thousand words trying to explain a concept when you can actually just look at a picture. So that really works for the general audience. And the third thing, the last thing, is that people like to hear stories about problems being solved. Uh, it's very comforting to hear stories. We like that. We, all our stories are about problems being solved, you know, conflict resolution, uh, evolution, how we manage to overcome things, and we've, as human beings, just been doing this this whole time. So I think it bodes well for sustainable science and sustainable science communication that people actually like to hear about problems being solved because now we have lots of problems and we're trying to create the awareness of all these problems and at some point, you know, maybe we can get people to participate also in the process of solving these problems through this kind of communication. One person that comes to mind when I talk about problems and solutions and the kind of attention that the stories that sometimes I write get, uh, Frank Doyle in Chemical Engineering, he has an artificial pancreas, which is phenomenal because it really takes the guesswork away from how to do dose for diabetes and when to shoot your, you know, when to g give yourself the injection. Um, and that's a huge burden lifted. And so when I write stories about things like that, I get emails from people asking, where can I go to do this? And we have an artificial pancreas for children coming out. Now, I have parents emailing me going, where can I put my children in clinical trials? So people would actually be happy, I think, if the, if the problem, if the story was made clear enough to them and the solution was made clear enough to them, they would actually want to participate in the solution. They want to participate in the clinical trials. They want to participate in, you know, certain pilot practices. So I think in that vein, I think we could keep them receptive as science communicators, and maybe they'll, uh, the solution will come, and we won't have to herd cats to get there. My ideal is that everybody understands, is eager, wants to do it, and will participate. So thanks to Dr. Susanna Scott and Dr. Ronald Rice for the opportunity to speak, and also to, for me to examine what I do and what people in my situation can do.